There is nothing improbable in this narrative, so far as it describes a great, rich, cultured, and educated people. Almost every part of Plato's story can be paralleled by descriptions of the people of Egypt or Peru. In fact, in some respects, Plato's account of Atlantis falls short of Herodotus's description of the grandeur of Egypt, or Prescott's picture of the wealth and civilization of Peru. For instance, Prescott, in his Conquest of Peru, Volume 1, page 95, says, The most renowned of the Peruvian temples, the pride of the capital and the wonder of the empire, was at Cusco, where, under the munificence of successive sovereigns, it had become so enriched that it received the name Coricancha, or the place of gold. The interior of the temple was literally a mine of gold. On the western wall was emblazoned a representation of the deity, consisting of a human countenance, looking forth from amid innumerable rays of light, which emanated from it in every direction, in the same manner as the sun is often personified with us. The figure was engraved on a massive plate of gold, of enormous dimensions, thickly powdered with emeralds and precious stones. The walls and ceilings were everywhere encrusted with golden ornaments, Every part of the interior of the temple glowed with burnished plates and studs of precious metal. The cornices were of the same material. There are in Plato's narrative no marvels, no myths, no tales of gods, gorgons, hobgoblins, or giants. It is a plain and reasonable history of a people who built temples, ships, and canals, who live by agriculture and commerce, who in pursuit of trade reached out to all the countries around them. The early history of most nations begins with gods and demons, while here we have nothing of the kind. We see an immigrant enter the country, marry one of the native women, and settle down. In time a great nation grows up around him. It reminds one of the information given by the Egyptian priest to Herodotus. During the space of 11,340 years, they assert, says Herodotus, that no divinity has appeared in human shape. They absolutely deny the possibility of human beings' descent from a god. If Plato had sought to draw from his imagination a wonderful and pleasing story, we should not have had so plain and reasonable a narrative. He would have given us a history like the legends of Greek mythology, full of the adventures of gods and goddesses, nymphs, fauns, and satyrs. Neither is there any evidence on the face of this history that Plato sought to convey in it a moral or political lesson, in the guise of a fable, as did Bacon in The New Atlantis, and more in The Kingdom of Nowhere. There is no ideal republic delineated here. It is a straightforward, reasonable history of a people ruled over by kings, living and progressing as other nations have lived and progressed since their day. Plato says that in Atlantis there was a great and wonderful empire, which aggressed wantonly across the whole of Europe and Asia, thus testifying to the extent of its dominion. It not only subjugated Africa as far as Egypt, and Europe as far as Italy, but it ruled as well over parts of the continent, to wit, the opposite continent of America, which surrounded the true ocean. Those parts of America over which it ruled were, as we will show hereafter, Central America, Peru, and the Valley of the Mississippi, occupied by the Mound Builders. Moreover, he tells us that this vast power was gathered into one, that is to say, from Egypt to Peru, it was one consolidated empire. We will see hereafter that the legends of the Hindus as to the Deva Nahusha, distinctly refer to this vast empire, which covered the whole of the known world. Another corroboration of the truth of Plato's narrative is found in the fact that upon the Azores, black lava rocks, and rocks red and white in color, are now found. He says they built with white, red, and black stone. Sir C. Y. Bill Thompson describes a narrow neck of land between Fayal and Mount Daguia, called Mount Quimada, the Burnt Mountain, as follows. It is formed partly of stratified tuffa, of a dark chocolate color, and partly of lumps of black lava, porous, and each with a large cavity in the center, 
which must have been ejected as volcanic bombs in a glorious display of fireworks at some period beyond the records of Acorian history, but late in the geological annals of the island. Voyage of the Challenger, Volume 2, page 24. He also describes immense walls of black volcanic rock in the island. The plain of Atlantis, Plato tells us, had been cultivated during many ages by many generations of kings. If, as we believe, agriculture, the domestication of the horse, ox, sheep, goat, and hog, and the discovery or development of wheat, oats, rye, and barley originated in this region, then this language of Plato in reference to the many ages and the successive generations of kings accords with the great periods of time which were necessary to bring man from a savage to a civilized condition. In the great ditch surrounding the whole land like a circle, and into which streams flowed down from the mountains, we probably see the original of the four rivers of paradise, and the emblem of the cross surrounded by a circle, which, as we will show hereafter, was from the earliest pre-Christian ages, accepted as the emblem of the Garden of Eden. We know that Plato did not invent the name of Poseidon, for the worship of Poseidon was universal in the earliest ages of Europe. Poseidon worship seems to have been a peculiarity of all the colonies previous to the time of Sidon. Prehistoric Nations, page 148. This worship was carried to Spain and to northern Africa, but most abundantly to Italy, to many of the islands, and to the regions around the Aegean Sea, also to Thrace. Ibid, page 155. Poseidon, or Neptune, is represented in Greek mythology as a sea god, but he is figured as standing in a war chariot drawn by horses. The association of the horse, a land animal, with the sea god is inexplicable, except with the light given by Plato. Poseidon was a sea god because he ruled over a great land in the sea, and was the national god of a maritime people. He is associated with horses, because in Atlantis, the horse was first domesticated, and, as Plato shows, the Atlanteans had great race courses for the development of speed in horses, and Poseidon is represented as standing in a war chariot, because doubtless wheeled vehicles were first invented by the same people who tamed the horse, and they transmitted these war chariots to their descendants from Egypt to Britain. We know that horses were the favorite object chosen for sacrifice to Poseidon by nations of antiquity within the historic period. They were killed and cast into the sea from high precipices. The religious horse feasts of the pagan Scandinavians were a survival of this Poseidon worship, which once prevailed along all the coasts of Europe. They continued until the conversion of the people to Christianity, and were then suppressed by the church with great difficulty. We find in Plato's narrative the name of some of the Phoenician deities among the kings of Atlantis. Where did the Greek Plato get these names if the story is a fable? Does Plato, in speaking of the fruits having a hard rind, affording drinks and meats and ointments, refer to the coconut? Again, Plato tells us that Atlantis abounded in both cold and hot springs. How did he come to hit upon the hot springs if he was drawing a picture from his imagination? It is a singular confirmation of his story that hot springs abound in the Azores, which are the surviving fragments of Atlantis. And an experience wider than that possessed by Plato has taught scientific men that hot springs are a common feature of regions subject to volcanic convulsions. Plato tells us, the whole country was very lofty and precipitous on the side of the sea, but the country immediately about and surrounding the city was a level plain, itself surrounded by mountains which descended toward the sea. One has but to look at the profile of the Dolphin's Ridge, as revealed by the deep sea soundings of the Challenger, given as the frontispiece to this volume, to see that this is a faithful description of that precipitous elevation. The surrounding mountains, which sheltered the plain from the north, are represented in the present towering peaks of the Azores. Plato tells us that the destruction of Atlantis filled the sea with mud, and interfered with navigation. For thousands of years, the ancients believed the Atlantic Ocean to be a muddy, shallow, dark, and misty sea, mare tenebrosum. 
Cosmos, Volume 2, page 151. The three-pronged scepter, or trident of Poseidon, reappears constantly in ancient history. We find it in the hands of Hindu gods, and at the base of all the religious beliefs of antiquity. Among the numerals, the sacred three has ever been considered the mark of perfection, and therefore exclusively ascribed to the supreme deity, or to its earthly representative, a king, emperor, or any sovereign. For this reason, triple emblems of various shapes are found on the belts, neckties, or any encircling fixture, as can be seen on the works of ancient art in Yucatan, Guatemala, Chiapas, Mexico, etc., whenever the object has reference to divine supremacy.